It's HBR, All Things Considered, and I'm Dave Lawrence. Today on the show, we are kicking off two days of welcoming special guests from Def Leppard, one of the biggest selling music acts of all time, with over 100 million albums sold. They play the Blaisdell Arena Friday and Saturday, where they will perform their 25 million copy selling Hysteria album in its entirety for what I believe are their first shows in Hawaii since a pair of dates at the arena in 1983. We'll find out now as we welcome back longtime Def Leppard guitarist, singer-songwriter, vegan, staunch animal supporter, and all-around nice guy, Phil Collin. Hey, brother, nice to hear your voice again. Thank you. Great to speak to you again as well. And when it comes to the fact that you're coming back here, it looks like the first time, and maybe the only time you guys played Hawaii was in September 1983 at the Blaisdell Arena. That is definitely the only time, yes, for sure. You remember it at all? I absolutely do. I've actually, me and Steve Clark wore a grass skirt for, for the encore, absolutely. <laughs> I distinctly remember. We played soccer against this local team, and no one had any shoes on. I remember, yeah, a bunch of it, actually. Obviously, I've been back to Hawaii a few times since, but usually Maui. That's cool, and you did some <laughs> soccer when you were here barefoot. Yeah. I like that. Boy, you sure have lived in California a long time to call it soccer and not football, huh? You really are American. Did I say that? <laughs> did I actually say that? <laughs> I, I, I drifted straight into soccer. Wow, I guess so. Uh. And uh, do you ever have people sit in, or that doesn't really happen with Def Leppard? Not really. I mean, usually the songs are pretty complex. We've done a Credence song once, and we got uh, Brian May up from Queen, and I think Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora another time, and that was pretty simple. But, you know, stuff like Photograph and those songs, yeah, they're very specific, and, and the harmony is that. We don't want someone to mess it up. So we, we traditionally don't do that. In Def Lab, but it's a very different structure, if you like. The songs are very structured. We use backing vocals as an instrument, and all of a sudden you can't really let anyone in on that because it's going to just change the dynamic. Phil also has some side projects that, riffing on what you were just saying, I'm imagining like this Man Rays and Delta Deep allow you to satisfy some of that stuff that it would be a little bit trickier to do with Def Leppard. Absolutely. I mean, because it's not got that structure, like I said, you know, we have this instrument, this is backing vocals, me, Rick Savage and, and Vivian Campbell, we, we kind of lock in. It's almost spiritual the way we get to sing together. And I, I love it. It's, it's just a, a very special thing. But um, with Def Leppard, you know, we have three part arm. It's very structured. So we, we tend not to do that. But yeah, Delta Deep and, and Man Rays, we're, we're able to kind of drift off and, and, and do a jam, literally go off on a tangent. And you can't do that with Def Leppard because it'd be like a house of cards. It all comes tumbling down. <laughs> That's a great description. And on that note of close-knit musical cooperation, I guess you could call it, where you guys really depend on each other for your sound, the guy behind the drums in Def Leppard, would be wrong if we didn't talk about Rick Allen. And not everybody listening may know this, but Rick lost an arm due to a car accident New Year's Eve 1984. And you guys did something so honorable. You pause as a band, let him relearn to play drums using his feet in an expanded capacity synced to electric drum pads that are just creating sounds he'd need to replace his left arm. They're not playing for him. And overcoming a significant disability, making musical history, which he does to this day, with one arm on the drums. And I wonder if... Kind of like living with a family member who can't walk, for example, like my mom did. And I just got used to it without thinking of all she had to overcome each day. How has Rick's remarkable tenacity affected you? Um, what's really cool about it, um, I, you do get used to it from a sound point of view, but you never take it for granted. You really go, wow, this is amazing what he's doing. And then, then I hear other drummers and I go, well... My guy can do that with one arm tied behind him. He literally can. You know, he actually does this stuff, and he really works at it. He consistently pushes it out there, like we all do. But with him, it's obviously a lot more because he has a, a physical disability. But he's able to keep getting better. He got a brand new acoustic kit the other day, and it, this thing was a monster. Just sounded incredible. He was just playing it. You would never have known that's a, a drum with one arm. So, you know, he has his special kit that, that's got like a bunch of different pedals on that. But when you hear him on a regular acoustic kit, he just sounds amazing. His dynamics are just just all there. It's, uh, and, and the sound of the snare is, is a lot of the time it's how you tune it, but also it's how you play it. But uh, he's a hero. He's, he, he does such amazing stuff. You talk about a one of a kind. It's pretty heavy when you stop and think, wow, there's nobody like Rick. Right. right. Ab I mean, absolutely. And there's an area of your life I, I was hoping to hear why you are. You're a vegan. You're apparently so much of an animal lover 
that you've worked to support PETA. And so I wonder what made this happen in your life that you've been able to be this way for decades? My grandmother left me a steak once. This is when I was, I guess, a teenager. And I'd always felt weird about eating meat. It kind of felt like I was eating a dead body, which essentially you are. And she left this bit of meat. It was bleeding and it had veins in it. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to put this in my mouth. <laughs> and then I, the more I got into that kind of thought process, I couldn't do it. They're just animal parts, living creatures. So just the whole thing of it just horrified me. So when I made the uh, absolute change and went over, I felt really good. I actually felt quite empowered to myself. It was, like, oh, and it was relief. And then I, I just got more into it. And then more things went, eggs went, all dairy and everything went seven or eight years ago, so I've been totally vegan since then. How old were you with the steak thing? Well, the steak thing, I was a teenager then, but as a kid, I actually had this feeling that kind of freaked me out a little bit. I, I didn't feel comfortable eating it. Same thing when I give up drinking, the amount of people that want you to, oh, go on, just have one, or take drugs or whatever, oh, go on, just try this. And it's peer pressure a lot of the time, you know, especially with kids, but I really didn't want to do it, and I was actually carrying on eating this stuff, really to please other people. And when I stopped it, it gave me a sense of empowerment of myself and it was just a choice you know I didn't care anyone can eat whatever they want they can drink whatever when it's totally cool but me personally I'd like doing what I want to do not what someone else right says on. to do so that, that was kind of cool and on your established love of animals I know you've had rescue dogs as pets you've worked for PETA people for the ethical treatment of animals what's your reaction to your home country the UK adopting a historic ivory ban this year well, I think it's awesome. I think that they should should be done all of it. These are endangered species. They're, they're disappearing. I mean, the last white rhino went. I mean, that, that's going to be gone. So um, I don't see why everyone wouldn't do that. I mean, we know what happens. You know, someone somewhere says, well, you need, it's a, a male enhancement. You know, if it makes you virile and makes you do all this stuff. And someone believes that uh, about ivory and tusks and stuff. And uh so while there's someone spreading that kind of stuff, you're going to have this. But I think it was a great thing to do that. I think most countries should. Most civilized countries should do that. Who thinks it's cool to shoot a slow-moving animal that cannot hide? Exactly. I mean, uh, yeah. The thing about that and those hunters that do the canned hunting and that, I've always said, look, if you really want to show how badass you are, take your clothes off, take your shoes off, and just get a stick and, and go and hunt a bear or a an elephant or a tiger or something, and let's see how, how you do. And then, then it's kind of a bit more balanced, you know. But yeah, the canned hunting thing is atrocious. It's disgusting. That whole thing is, is pretty uh, cowardly. It's, it's no, no other word for it. Well, as we go to wrap it up, on the opposite end of people you think are cowards would be your heroes. And I know you've had some incredible encounters, but not all the details. For example, with Deep Purple as your first show ever, I've often wondered, have you ever gotten to interact with legendary guitar player Richie Blackmore? Blackmore, I think, for sure, yeah. You did? Absolutely, yeah, a few times. Actually, come and jam with us on stage. He he came, my old band, Girl, he, he, he came and played with us. Whoa! Back mm. in the rainbow era for him, I guess it was. Absolutely, yeah. And that was that was just mind-blowing. That was crazy. Any other hero encounters like that that you would oh, say? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I got to play with Jeff Beck just over a year ago. That was mind-blowing. And uh, Jimmy Page, I, I was, it was just um, obviously Brian May. Uh, but, but Jimmy, you know, said the most wonderful things and really supportive. You know, when we were doing all the, all the rehearsals and that, you know, he'd be going there and trying to get them to turn my guitar up and everything. And it, it was just just wonderful being around him and Jeff Beck and, you know, two absolute idols. And, and again, you know, I just got to play with The Who. You know, we, we played a couple of shows down in uh, South America. And it was just really cool hanging out with Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey. That, it was amazing. So all of these, these people made such a, had a huge impact on, on my life and, and to, to hang out with them and, and then be super cool was, was just great, you know? It's gigantic. It's Phil Collin from Def Leppard, a formidable guitarist, a great singer, and really nice guy, too, as you've been hearing. Coming to town, Blaisdell Arena. Hope this was okay today. Yeah, great. Actually, excellent. Really, really cool. And thanks again. I'm giving you a hug and a high five. I really appreciate it. And thanks for doing oh, Pleasure. Thanks for sticking up for the animals. Be safe. I'll talk to you soon, Phil. You too. Thank you. Aloha, you brother. Soon. Cheers. Aloha. Hello, I Phil Collin from Death Leopard. I don't care if you're giving away a lifetime supply of veggie burgers. I won't miss this show. You and I are listening to All Things Considered with our good friend and fellow animal lover, 
Dave Lawrence.